Man has hunted since the beginning of time. What began with crude weapons and animal images scrawled on cave walls has developed into a multi-million dollar industry. From the Tilton Hiltons to the mansions in the marsh, we hunt and we cook. Everything from rabbits and raccoons to deer and ducks while learning about the passion of sportsmen through the ages. Man's love affair with hunting is really not about the kill, but how to prepare a sumptuous wild game banquet after the hunt. Now get that camouflage apron and join me, Chef John Foles, for another Taste of Louisiana. Funding for After the Hunt with Chef John Foles is brought to you by the Baton Rouge Area Convention and Visitors Bureau. Day is dawning on the Mississippi River and the sun is shining on Baton Rouge. Attractions, shopping, food, and southern hospitality you know and love. Go BR and go brighter and the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting. Our mission is to tell Louisiana's story to the world. And by the Louisiana Department of Culture, Recreation, and Tourism. Vacation planning guides are available at louisianatravel.com. You wait all year for your vacation. Don't sleep through it. Sportsman's Paradise for another edition of A Taste of Louisiana. I'm thrilled to have all of you in the studio audience with us today, as well as all of the viewers back home. I just wish you were here with us because it smells like goose in the kitchen today, doesn't it? <laughs> Smell, oh yeah, huh? Yeah. Our kitchen musicians, y'all, Sylvester Strings right here. Thanks for stirring up the room. <laughs> Boats have always been an important part of the Louisiana landscape and the inhabitants of Louisiana from the Native Americans who used these boats to traverse the bayous in their dugouts to the fur trappers floating down the Mississippi River from Canada to the land of Louis. Many believe that Bienville, Louisiana's first governor and founder of New Orleans, traded iron pots with the Native Americans in exchange for these wonderful cypress pirogs. Before I learned to drive a car, I learned to paddle and pull a pirog. The lost art of boat building is being preserved today by builders like Keith Felder and Jules Lambert. I was so intrigued with their skill and passion, I asked them to build a pirog for me, and they did. Let's take a look. I grew up in St. James Parish, Louisiana, where my dad's only mode of transportation was his Cypress dugout pirog. I inherited that pirog and proudly displayed it in my restaurant for over 20 years until the restaurant burned, taking my fabulous heirloom into the flames with it. Lucky for me, I met Keith Felder and Jules Lambert, who decided to dedicate their retirement years to making boats. So I asked them to make me a pirog. Thankfully, they agreed. First, they pulled a sink of cypress log from Lake Maurepas that's estimated to be about 1,400 years old. Once the log was retrieved and left to dry for a while, a chainsaw was used to cut the log to length. This particular dugout will be 12 feet long. Ideally, Keith and Jules likes to work with a tent, a trim log that's about 12 inches, say high, 30 inches wide, and about 14 feet long. Next, the log was cut in half and carefully examined for shakes. Now, a shake is a crack in the center of the log. Strong winds, rough storms, and even hurricanes may have twisted that tree when it was young, causing a defect in the center. Once they determine that the wood is solid, the cant is shaped. The cypress slab is carefully marked to the shape of the pirog. After it's marked, Keith and Jules cut away everything on the outside of the lines using a one-man bucking saw, felling axe, broad axe, and hatchet. After the top side of the cant is shaped to the markings, the cant is turned over so the outside can be finished to shape. Once the cant is to the proper thickness, the pirog shape is laid out on the inside of the log. The cant is rolled over for the bottom layout. Now, this is no easy task, considering that that cant or that log will weigh over a ton. 
Next, a line is marked four inches inside the dugout shape all the way around to the bottom. Then, a line is drawn two inches from the top side. Once the lines are drawn, the corners between the two lines is removed with a hatchet and axe, completing the rough end shape of the solid P-Rog cant. Next, a large hole is dug on each end, about eight to 10 inches deep and within two inches of the bottom of the P-Rog. The purpose of these holes is to control water and sap. If the water evaporates from the end of the P-Rog too fast, the cant will crack. As the P-Rog body is dug out, the water flows and will stop at the holes, preventing a crack or break. The wall of the P-Rog should be three-fourths to one inch thick. A line is drawn to mark this dimension and digging out of the interior begins. The guys use several tools, including a carpenter's foot adze, a gutter adze, and a cooper's hand adze. With the use of the ads, the interior wood is chipped away a little at a time. The guys remember the thickness of the walls as they chip and work down to one and a half inches to the bottom of that boat. Carefully, Keith and Jules smooth the walls and floors of the P-Rog with a hand adze, pull shave, scrapers, and sandpaper, leaving the interior floor a little rough so that the future boat owner won't slip. Next, the exterior is smooth with planes, draw knives, and spoke shaves, and is carefully sanded. The brass hook is trimmed and the stems oiled. My own little treasure from the past is complete in about six months. The replacement of my dad's treasure lost so many years ago in that fire. Boy, did um, did y'all did y'all see the way I paddle in? Uh, you saw saw that style right there, huh? Huh? Y'all, my boat builders right here, Keith Felder and Jules Lambert, right there, huh? Huh? Oh yeah, I gotta do a, I have to do a very special thank you. What talent these guys have! Did you see that process? Uh, uh, imagine us, uh, I was thinking that if I was just to chop down a tree and start doing one of those, I'd probably end up with this blowgun. <laughs> uh, talking about a blowgun, we have a couple of Native Americans uh, with the traditions of Native Americans in Louisiana in the house today. In fact, I have Laura and Chasson right here. Who's that? Uh, Thank you. And you and, I, you and I did some great cooking together. Yes, we did. Huh? Yes, we did. Uh, and uh, we made a little uh, goose jerky. Yes, we did. Huh? <laughs> and... Uh, 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 Janie, why don't you take this? I'm gonna try to uh, shoot. Uh, uh, you know, I'm gonna try to shoot a, uh, a blowgun. I'm gonna try to. I'm gonna try to shoot like. A, I don't have an apple. Would you take a bell pepper? Uh, I'm gonna try to see if I can shoot that bell pepper off. Uh, I think I can. I think I can do this. Y'all watch. Right there. There it is. Huh? <laughs> anyway. Great to have y'all. I see you have all the working tools here. Um, quickly, before I start chatting about the P-Rog, um, I have the, um, uh, a, a beautiful speckle belly goose here, and I've turned it over, and I've cut slits under the breast. You see this right here? Uh, so you know why? Because this is uh, where pepper, this is where salt, this is where garlic, this is where a lot of good fresh garlic goes. You know what I mean? Obviously, y'all don't like the seasoned goose. Uh, you're sitting out there like this the first time you ever saw a goose. Uh, have you never had your goose cooked? Is that what the problem is? Okay, a little salt, a little pepper, a little granulated garlic, and a little bit fresh garlic in there, right? Once you do it, yeah, now you're talking business, huh? Now we're going to season it a little bit with salt. Now I put a lot, yeah. I put... I put a lot on the inside. Why? Because that bony structure, right? We have all that bony structure in there. Now I'm going to put a few. Uh, this is Rose Goose Holly Beach. Anybody knows where Holly Beach is in Louisiana? It's called the Cajun Riviera. Yeah. Huh? yeah, the Cajun Riviera. That's the best we have uh, in the swamp lands over there. It's pretty good. The beach isn't sand. It's mud, but it's about water's good. Huh? <laughs> Okay, so my apple goes in here, and yes, we do grow apples in Louisiana, two different varieties. And now, I would season this and rub it in. Look, you have to rub that goose really nice. I really enjoy this. <laughs> <sighs> One of my favorite pastimes. Sometimes I'll rub it for hours. As well. <laughs> um, um, <laughs> I'm goosing it. Okay, 
Uh, so anyway, once that's done, I put it in my pot. Now, y'all take a look at the pot. I've got this really going nicely here. Now, you got a good shot of that? Now I'm going to put all of my carrots, my garlic. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, apples, you with me? Huh? The more the merrier, right? Huh? Yeah, you can. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Huh? That girl knows what she's talking about over there. Or, or, or were you goose? Huh? Were you goose maybe, huh? Okay, now I'm into that. I'm going to put a little bit of wine. Y'all with me? Yeah. Oh, a little bit more wine, huh? Yeah. All of it, I see, huh? Okay. I'm going to also put a little bit of the uh, stock right down in there like that. I'm going to bring this to, th- I'm going to bring it to a rolling boil. I think you know what I'm going to do. Rolling boil, and I can put it in the oven, right? 375 degrees for an hour or so. Yeah. Or I can pot roast it right on top of the oven. Pot roasting is for people who have nothing to do. Because you have to come up to the pot every now and then and say, is it cooking? Yeah, it's cooking, it's cooking. Yeah, it looks pretty good. Whereas if it's in the oven, it'll cook itself. That's what I like about pot roasting. Now, guys, I have to talk to y'all. My boat builders, I, I, uh, uh, l- l- let me just start. Uh, uh, either one of you jump in because y'all are gr- one of the greatest working teams on boat building I've ever seen. I would understand that woodworking would be something nice, a little shop in the backyard, you know, maybe a little rocking chair or something for the grandkids. But to yeah. lift a 1,400-year-foot <laughs> log, log out of Lake yeah. Morapoint and drag it yeah. home and make a boat for six months, that's not woodworking. That's a talent. Right. That's a craft. That's a passion. And Keith, even the tools, uh, even the tools to create something like that mm-hmm. magnificent boat right there, in many cases had to be made because the art is lost, huh? That's right. Yeah, you, you can't buy them. And uh, matter of fact, we took uh, blacksmithing classes so we could learn to make our own. You know, the one what we used most is, uh, is a 1953 Chevrolet truck leaf spring. <laughs> 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 I mean, that's history. We remember that, you know. Was, uh, yeah, I could see, I could see Bienville walking up to the uh, chief of the home all that night and say, I, I, "We need to build a pier." Well, I have a, a, a spring from my Chevrolet over here, you know. <laughs> but what, yeah. what's the most challenging part, other than lifting a five-ton log out of a lake with a crane? What's the most challenging part of making that boat right there? It's trying to see the boat in the log. You know, you're trying to see, you're trying to get as long a boat as you can and as wide as a boat as you can, and then you're trying to picture what design you want and see where the lines are. Uh, a log that's uh, 800 or 1,000 years old, uh, you don't know what's inside of it. I mean, I found wood duck nests inside the, the boat. Inside the tree. They that, grew around. That's been covered up right uh, for probably uh, four or 500 years, and you wouldn't have known that was in that tree. Well, I, I tell you that the craft is absolutely incredible. I'm, I'm just so impressed with what y'all do. And then to get in it and paddle it, uh, let me tell you, it's an experience of lifetime watching it being built out of the log and then getting in it and paddling down the bayou. That's a special place to be. Let's give my hand, y'all. I'm going to put gravy, huh? Absolutely. Now, look out. Look at my finished piece here. Y'all looking at talking about my finished piece. I saw that goose just like that when it was wrong. I did, just like they do on the law. Now I'm going to put a little apple gravy. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh yeah. Come on. Uh, I tell you what, from that weak sigh, I don't even think you like apples, huh? huh? <laughs> anyway, y'all, that's it right there. That's what it looks like. Now, as I mentioned, just a couple of months ago, I took a trip to one of the great, great, great places. I went to make a little goose jerky with Laura Ann. Let's take a look at that. What a beautiful afternoon on, on Il Jean Charles, which is, I have to ask my, my friend standing next to me here, Laurien Chasson, where is Il Jean Charles? Well, it's, a, it's uh, the lower part of uh, Pornichan, one of the streets that goes off of Pornichan. People consider it Montague, but uh, we consider it, you know. Now, this was uh, a Homa Indian land. This was from the Homa Nation, of which, of course, your family, uh, all of your ancestors are, are Homa, uh, right? That and, is correct. Uh, and, and now, this wasn't always a swamp land as we see it here now. Yeah. Originally, I'm hearing from your father that this was great farmland. It was at one time. And then when the oil fields came in here and they dug the canals to get to the oil, then it, all the salt water intrusions has come in over the years 
and has destroyed the land. Yeah, now this was also a great hunting ground. Yes. It was great fishing village. Oysters and shrimp came out of this area. It was a beautiful part of the wetlands of Louisiana and what the hurricanes and other damage have done is just unbelievable. But the home of being great fishermen, great cooks, naturally you're a great <laughs> cook, and also great hunters. I decided today to do an Indian gift uh, to America, and that is the jerkies or the cured meats over fire and smoke. So I'm gonna do a little uh, a little duck jerky. Normally I make it with goose, but today I'm gonna make it with a, a, a little duck. I'm gonna pull the breast off just like this. I have some already done, but you can see uh, you can see how that, that breast comes right off of that like that. And then I just take it and slice it just really nice and thin like this. And of course I have some already in my bowl here, so I'm not gonna worry about it. I have some already done here. So you ready to go ahead and put a little sure. flavor in here? Now let's, we're gonna start with a little bit of water. Just throw <laughs> some in. We need to marinate the, the duck or the goose to be able to get the flavor in the jerky. Let's go with the uh, tomato. And of course you can make jerky with venison. You can make it with beef, pork. It doesn't matter, wild boar. A little bit of the soy sauce. Now this mm. is a, that's good. You, you can't, you can't hurt, you can't hurt. <laughs> One thing about Louisiana cooking, and I'm sure, I'm sure home of cooking, you can't hurt. A little bit, of, a little bit more of that, a little bit more of that. Okay, okay. all right. <laughs> that's the Worcestershire. Now the liquid smoke is interesting. You can put just a couple little dashes in there. Now the Homer would have smoke this right. over fires. That's where that would be. Do you remember any drying or curing of meats over fire, raccoon or anything like that? No, not not over here, but I've actually uh, witnessed it in, when I was in uh, the Flathead Reservation in Montana. Right, that's And good they right was there. actually uh, drying uh, deer and elk. Oh, right, over yes, the fire. So over the liquid the fire. smoke gives us that smoke in the right. jerky. Now we put in a little liquid smoke, Lee and Perrins, we put in a little soy sauce, we put in some onion powder, some garlic. I'm gonna come back in right now and I'm gonna put a little touch of salt, pepper, granulated garlic, and I tell you, it's a beautiful area back here and I, I was noticing all of the trees that the salt water intrusion from the hurricanes are really started to damage and they're starting to die out. That's a shame. That huh? is, that it yeah. really is. So y'all, this is 24 hours in the refrigerator. Uh, it's gonna pick up all that great flavor. I have a dehydrator here. Let's say it's there for 24 hours. I take it out. I'd, I'd make sure it's dry really well mm -hmm. like this. I'd go into my meat tenderizer at 155 degrees, just like the home Indians did 200 <laughs> years ago. Just not, like. Not with <laughs> and you wanna know what it looks like when it's finished? Look at it right here, coming out of the smoker, out of the dehydrator, it's nice. And you could pound that along with nuts and fat to make pemmican one of the most famous dishes of the Native Americans. There it is, y'all. All right, all right. Well, wasn't, that, uh, wasn't she great making a little goose jerky, huh? <laughs> You know, dear, uh, while watching that, I learned that she had been elected vice principal of the Homa Nation. Uh, 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 tell me about that. I'm just hearing this. Vice principal? <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, I, now, what does that mean? Um, it's the vice principal chief of uh, the United Homa Nation. Vice principal chief yes. of the United Homa right. Nation. Right. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Now tell, uh, tell us about all this. I have to make some brats, but I have to find out about some of that wonderful stuff you have here. These, these are just a few of our, our tribal members' um, wood carving here. Um, this is Mr. John Parfait. These two pieces right here. The, actually, his uh, pieces are act in the Smithsonian, the Native American Smithsonian wow. in Washington, D.C. They're fantastic. And, oh. Yes, and these right here are also uh, some of our uh, Roy Parfait, his carving and his alligator, which I think is very, very uh, Just beautiful. beautiful. You, you know what I love is this, this uh, I want y'all to get a, 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 a oh, look, look at this. This right here, this is a moss doll. Yes. Right here, that's made with the dried moss right here off of the, the trees that uh, Correct. Uh, around that. This is, uh, is this an older one? Yes, it is. It's a very, one of our elders, she's 94 years old, Miss Marie Dean. Can you imagine and that? And she still does basket weaving. This is her daughter's basket weave right here. This is one of her fans. And, and is that the, that's what you use? What is this? This is palmetto. This is dried palmetto. Just, and that's off, what, just off of the land. The, right. Huh? Yes. Now, now uh, uh, 
that, that little island, uh, Ile Jean Charles over there, uh, all of the, the Native Americans there were fishermen. Are, are, are they still fishermen in yes, that area? Yes, sir. Trappers as well. Trappers, trappers and hunters, yes. huh? That's correct. And how, what about pres preserving all of the customs and foodways and all of that? A lot of that's still a part of what's yes. going on? We still, uh, traditionally, we've uh, been trappers and fishermen, and they still do that to this day. Probably well, congratulations 80%. on your leadership. And that's Thank so let's you. give her another hand, y'all. That's fantastic, huh? Uh, how uh, I'm gonna make a little uh, I'm gonna make one of my favorite Native American dishes, brats. A uh, bratwurst. Oh no, I'm sorry, that's German. But I guarantee you one thing: the Germans got it from a group of Native Americans somewhere. I can guarantee you that. Okay, let me tell you what we have here, y'all. Look at my beautiful platter. I have goose breast. You see this right here? This is goose breast ground. This is pork. So I'm gonna put goose breast in pork. Not often do you combine goose breast and pork in your kitchen, huh? but I do right here. And then into that, I'm going to put a, a few little, uh, a little herbs and spice, a little marjoram right here, a little bit of these wonderful little seeds. What kind of seeds do we have here, y'all know? Huh? Uh, a little, little mustard, a little ginger, a little white pepper. You know what else I'm going to put in here? I'm going to put in some uh, hot peppers. Yeah, this is the uh, this is the chipotle peppers that have that good adobo sauce from the Spanish. I'll go down in there, and I'm gonna mix this up all together because this is gonna be the brats in here. We have the caraway seeds that I mentioned. Well, I didn't tell you caraway, but that's what it is. Uh, yeah, caraway German. You know what I mean? Uh, now I'm gonna mix all of this together, and while I'm uh, uh, spooning this around, I want you to imagine that I have a one of those big sausage stuffers here. I'm going to put it right down in here. These are some I made earlier today because if I'd have been trying to talk and do all of this, we'd be a game to the Native American diet was so important back then. What about today? Is it, game still a big part of the table? Yes, it is. It's give, still. Me, give me an example of some of the dishes that would be found on your on your table today. <laughs> rabbit, you would find definitely rabbit cooked yeah. down with onions or tomato and raccoon. Um. Raccoon, I love it. <laughs> And um, all the birds you want. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, every, every, look, 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 if it flies, if it crawls, if it That's slithers right. through the swamp, right there, y'all. Uh, Christmas dinner right there, and I'm going to be with you. Uh, other boats that you build, now, I know you do the P-Rog, but you also do other boats. What other type of boats, and who's asking for you to build boats? Who, uh, who's coming to you? I build a lot of uh, different kinds of P-Rogs. A lot of people don't know they've got different kinds of P-Rogs all over Louisiana. Right. But uh, I make a John boat, uh, Louisiana, uh, a Chaffla Basin bateau, uh, make punch train skiffs, rowing skiffs. So you do make so. a wide variety. Now, people are coming because why, do, why are they building these boats to use or as collectors? Because yeah. you're doing some fancy work. Both. Both? Both. Right. Yeah, yeah most of the time it's uh, somebody that's wanting to collect because we use the uh, old 800-year-old uh, plus uh, cypress wood. Uh, can't compete with a Walmart, so you... We move it up a notch. <laughs> I'm not touching it. <laughs> I'm not touching it. Now, what I will touch is my goose brats. Right. Now, look, if you don't want to stuff it, y'all, what about just a nice breakfast patty? Look at that, huh? What about a nice breakfast patty like that? You liking this? Oh, yeah. Now, all of you, how many people have goose in their freezer and saying, I'm not cooking that? <laughs> Let me tell you something. If they kill it, you need to cook it. If an animal, the tradition of the Native Americans said if you killed it, the animal gave its life for you, right. every piece of it needed to be consumed, right? That's right. So I want you to think about converting it. And if you don't want to cook a whole goose, make a broth like this. Just grind it up with pork and make sausage out of it. It's going to be wonderful. Y'all, look at my skillet here. I'm going to go into it now with a little bit onions. You with me? I'm going to call. Yeah, I know, you, I know what you mean. I'm going to come in with all of that. Uh, beer, y'all ready? I knew it. I knew beer would bring you out of your seats right there. Uh, since you like beer so much, I'm going to go with three, all right, huh? <laughs> <See that? laughs> now, again, you have to season the pot. You have to get some nice, and I'm using some granulated garlic here. Remember, I have all of the great flavors in there as well. Now, this is going to just smother. I'll put a lid on top of it, and I'll let it go for a long, long period of time. Let me get a, I wish you were up here with me because I have a nice brat. And I have a really nice pan full of onions like that. I have some, uh, 
Where's my Dusseldorf Dusseldorf mustard right here? (laughs) Dusseldorf mustard right there. Oh, it's um, it's fantastic. Y'all, I want to thank you for being with me today. I want to thank all of you for coming here. I want to thank you for my vote. I want to thank you for all of that. I want to thank all of you. I want to certainly thank Sylvester String right there. And I want to thank all of you for joining me in the swamps of Louisiana. And remember, y'all, it's a man's love affair with hunting. It's not about the kill. It's not about the skill. It's all about the fabulous feast after the hunt. I'm going to see you next time on A Taste of Louisiana. Come up here, star. To purchase the After the Hunt cookbook by Chef John Foles, an After the Hunt t-shirt or program DVD, call the number on your screen. Funding for After the Hunt with Chef John Fulz is brought to you by the Baton Rouge Area Convention and Visitors Bureau. Day is dawning on the Mississippi River and the sun is shining on Baton Rouge. Attractions, shopping, food, and southern hospitality you know and love. Go BR and go brighter. And the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting. Our mission is to tell Louisiana's story to the world. And by the Louisiana Department of Culture, Recreation, and Tourism. Vacation planning guides are available at louisianatravel.com. You wait all year for your vacation. Don't sleep through it.